Good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome. Uh, you can clap yourself in the back for being part of the largest audience we've had in this space for quite some time, which is an expectation of great pearls of wisdom coming from both the speakers and from the audience as well. Could I, first of all, just do some housekeeping? The door that you came in is the door that you go out in the event of there being a necessity to be forced out of this building. It hasn't happened in the past, but you should be aware of it. And secondly, if you wouldn't mind, can you turn these off, not on silent, preferably, unless you have to, but uh, it does affect our recording of the uh, proceedings. The um, contributions from the speakers are on the record, but the discussion afterwards is subject to European House rules or Chatham House rules, which is you can use the information that you receive or hear, but you can't necessarily attribute to where you heard it or who said it. That provides for a tradition that has worked very, very well in our 30 years uh, in this institution. Uh, we've not had an abuse of that particular caveat. So I would like now to ask our first speaker, um, Graeme Love, to give his introduction and his comments. You're very welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Rory. Um, the Higher Education Authority has five very clear functions set out under Section 3 of our 1971 Act. These are furthering the development of higher education, assisting in the coordination of state investment in higher education and preparing proposals for such investment, promoting an appreciation of the value of higher education and research, important today, promoting the attainment of a quality of opportunity in higher education, and fifth, promoting the democratization of the structure of higher education. Okay? Supporting a public debate on an issue as key as the future of funding meets all five of these functions, and indeed, they should be seen as complementary to each other and not simply as individual functions of the authority. We're delighted, therefore, to sponsor today's discussions here at the Institute for International and European Affairs, and we hope that the deliberations will assist us in our policy work and advocacy for the higher education and research system. The scale of the funding challenge for Irish higher education is enormous. We should learn from other countries, both from positive experiences and from mistakes. We must also remember that unique circumstances also pertain here in Ireland. Key among them is that our participation rate in higher education is one of the highest in the world, and that because of the demographic bulge working its way through our system, we have very high levels of demand now and into the medium term. There is always a danger in these discussions of bamboozling with figures, so I'll try to keep them at a high level, but I think it's important that the discussion today is set in context. Last year, we had about 44,000 new full-time undergraduate entrants to the system. That is up 7% in five years. We have 70,000 graduates now annually, about 49,000 of these from undergraduate courses, both full-time and part-time. That is up 16% in five years. In total, we now have over 180,000 full-time and about 38,000 part-time students in the system. Against that background of significant growth in student numbers, state investment in higher education declined 38% from about 2 billion in 2009 to 1.3 billion in 2016. The decrease in state funding was compensated somewhat by an increase in the student con contribution, which currently stands at 3,000 per annum. The latest international comparator figures indicate that expenditure on tertiary education in Ireland, including both public and private spending, was about 1.2% of GDP in 2013, below the OECD average of 1.6%. The recurrent cost of an average undergraduate student, all things included, is estimated at about 9,000 euro annually. So even where the student pays 3,000, that means another 6,000 must be found from somewhere to meet the cost of that investment. 
For every new place that we wish to create in our system, we need to ensure that money is also provided if we do not wish quality to be threatened. We should also remember that over 40% of full-time undergrads are in receipt of grants, which means that the state also pays the 3,000 contribution on those cases. As you know, part-time students do not qualify for the free fees initiative. I think regard should also be had to the other costs faced by students on the rising cost of student accommodation in particular. We are part of an active cross-departmental working group to address the student housing issue, but these costs also present a major challenge for students and their families. The IIEA has brought together an excellent series of speakers today who will guide us through these challenges and outline in their view why particular approaches will or will not work. The HEA would like to see more debates like this, which will help to encourage a greater awareness of the value of higher education and research. The value of higher education and research. I must distress that. And these discussions should not be confined to those of us directly engaged inside the system. Higher education and research will continue to underpin Ireland's economic and social development, but only where we have a sustainable funding model, and we do not have one at present. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Graeme. Our next speaker is uh, Peter Castells. Very welcome, and the author of the report that carries his name. Thank you very much, um, Rory. Uh, I thought for a moment there the chair was going to have a difficulty with my name. Is it uh, Cassells or is it Castles? And I feel the same about the report because listening to many of the debates and discussions, both inside and outside of Parliament on the report, I'm convinced there are two reports. There's the Cassells report and there's the Castles report. And uh, because some things I've heard I'm still not sure which report they're in or whether we ever actually said those things. So I'm going to try and, as it were, demystify some of the things here today. I want to thank the Institute and the HEA for organising this particular discussion and for the opportunity to talk about it. I know most of you are thinking, well, the report is over two years old, uh, so what's happening and uh, why are we still debating and, and discussing it? However, on the other hand, we could say there has been some small momentum in the sense that some funding has begun again uh, into the sector that wasn't there before. Uh, also, I think there's a general sense that the issues do need to be addressed and to be resolved. And therefore, I suppose part of the strategy at the moment is keeping the debate alive and keeping the, a strong focus on the particular issues. But we do, at some stage, and some stage soon, need to get to, the, to decisions. Now, I don't intend to go through the report. I'm going to make the assumption that all of you have read it. Uh, but I'm not going to go through it because it's not a technical report. And I want to stress that. It's a report that deals with a major societal challenge uh, that is a fundamental public policy area and pol public policy choices that need to be made. And they are difficult choices. And there are choices, obviously, that at the end of the day have to be made for politicians, but it's not just for politicians, it's for all of us in terms of how these, this choice is going to be uh, addressed. So instead of going into the technical details of the report, I'm going to concentrate on the context and on the thinking behind the various conclusions and recommendations and why did we come to those particular uh, conclusions and, and recommendations. Now, you know and will be aware that the, I suppose, overall conclusion of the report is that higher education has been at the heart of this country's transformation and that we need to uh, restore it to being a key enabler of our future development. The country has been a number of times at a, a turning point, but is at a turning point at the moment. We know that we're transitioning out of a very a deep crisis, not just a deep economic crisis, but also a deep social crisis arising from the consequences of the economic crisis. We are striving to uh, restore development and revive development and to lay out the foundations for future prosperity, while at the same time addressing 
many societal challenges. There's obviously the challenge of the health services that we know about, the challenges of housing that have emerged, there's Brexit, there's what's happening generally in the world around uh, trade and development, there's climate change, there's the conflicts that emerge worldwide out of all of these sort of developments, there's technology, there's the digitization across multiple platforms of the way in which we're going to work and live, and that in itself is changing the world for us. That gives us huge uncertainty, uh, and there are no obvious immediate answers you can take down from the shelf. So people do ask, and the question has been asked, is, well, what's our strategy for dealing with all of this? And at the end of the day, the report concludes that the main strategy we have is our capabilities and our people, and that therefore, as a people, we need to rebuild and re enhance our capabilities both at the individual or personal level, at the interpersonal level in terms of how we address the challenges and opportunities we face, and at an institutional level. And that the big requirement in that context as to how you rebuild and enhance those capabilities, as I said, at a personal, interpersonal, and institutional level, is significant investment in higher education, further education, apprenticeships, and post-second level opportunities. So that is the sort of platform that we are, we're working off. And the, and the title of the report was quite deliberate. It said, investing in national ambition. Took a lot of discussion with various government departments to get them to agree to that particular phrase, as it were, but that is what we were determined to try and convey as to why, how you would look at this uh, particular issue. Now, the other issue of context, and I said I'd talk about context and, and, and thinking, is that this requirement for a significant investment in higher education and further education apprenticeships uh, is coming at a time, of course, when even though our national finances have stabilized, there is still a stretch in terms of what resources are available for public expenditure, and also how some incomes themselves as well remain stretched and, and limited. And at the same time, we are facing multiple competing choices with understandable demands for increase in resources, particularly in health services, housing, and the other challenges I mentioned earlier. Now, I deliberately call them competing choices. They're not conflicting choices, which brings us back to the question as to why this isn't a technical issue. It is about the public policy, political and societal choices that we have to make. And all of this is also coming at a time when you would say, well, surely we can just uh, you know, take the current system and tweak it a bit, and tweak it and shape it and reshape it slightly. But in fact, the report concludes that the current system of funding higher education is no longer sustainable. So that's the other important context that we had to look at and deal with. It points out that the current system, first of all, fails to recognize the pressures that are facing the higher education institutions, and I'll come back to that in terms of the staffing and student ratios and that, but also the scale of the demographic, demographic changes that we're facing, and uh, already Graham has, has mentioned those. And it also fails to recognize the pressures that families and students are under not just because of the 3,000 uh, fee that is paid, even though, as we know, over half of them uh, get some uh, level of support for that, but also the high living and maintenance costs associated with studying and with successfully progressing to, through college, because it's not just a question of entry, it's a question of progressing through the whole uh, system. So to deal with those contexts, the group recommended, first of all, that there should be an immediate increase in resources to deal with current problems. People seem to believe that, in fact, what we did was recommend a reform system, and that that's what the discussion was. We did say there were two phases to this, the first one being an immediate increase in resources to deal with current pressures, but also then early agreement on a reformed integrating funding system for higher education. And I'll come back to that emphasis on reformed integrated system because that is what it needs to be. And within that then you would significantly increase investment 
for higher education, taking account, as I mentioned earlier, the increased demographics, the capital needs, and restoring the staff-student ratio. And also enhancing the financial supports for students, including an increase in the value of the payments and an extension of those supports to part-time and postgraduate students. And that this increase in investment must be underpinned by complementary reforms within the higher education system. In other words, that more flexibility, much more effective and much more uh, responsive. So again, I just want to emphasize the point that today's discussion is about funding, but we saw this as an integrated approach where the funding would be integrated with, again, significant reform in the way in which the system will become more f flexible uh, and will become more effective and responsive. And we did realize, of course, that that part two, as I mentioned, would require a fairly constructive and realistic uh, discussion. Now, I want to c come down to what was the thinking behind the if that was the context, what was the thinking behind the specific recommendations uh, uh, and conclusions that we came? And it's interesting that the debate so far on the report, there appears to be general agreement on the funding requirements. In other words, a scale of investment is needed. It doesn't matter what the, the, the figures are. However, when it comes to then how would you fund that investment, different people and different stakeholders and different approaches continue to have a particular model of funding as their first preference. Now, the important thing, and the report emphasizes this, is there's nothing wrong with all of us having a first preference, but we have to move and get beyond that stage. Because if the discussion doesn't converge and just restates preferences leading to stalemate, we're simply going to be back to consolidating the status quo which, as I mentioned earlier, is un unsustainable. And the reason it's important to emphasize that is the status quo is not a cost-free option. The existing funding system is imposing costs in terms of the quality of the student experience and the learning outcomes, even though, understandably, the institutions can't show that from the rooftops for all obvious reasons. It also means there's the exclusion of young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. The career opportunities of our graduates in what, as I mentioned earlier, is a very changing uh, labor market, is uh, under pressure. And ultimately, the contribution that I mentioned earlier that higher education needs to make to our future economic and social development, it is also threatened. So I think there has to be some level of agreement that the status quo is not an option, and therefore we need to get into constructive and realistic debate about the options, which in turn obviously means often moving away from our own first preferences. Sometimes people are seeking refuge in funding models from abroad, and that we might uh, copy them. Now, there are available international examples and approaches that have attractive features, but the key thing about them is again, going back to the context, in many areas, the context is totally different. We have a growing, young, a dynamic population, which is going to be of huge benefits to us that other countries don't have. Or they have a particular approach, societal approach, to how public services or other services are funded that's different. The challenge for us is to identify a model of funding, a reformed model, that suits the Irish context while drawn, of course, on some of the best features of what others have developed and has, has, has worked elsewhere, but not believing that you can suddenly copy and transfer something from somewhere else. Now, I just want to say a few brief words then about the thinking behind the level of funding that we said was required. Um, as William will know, that the Department of Finance and Department of Public Expenditure probably had multiple heart attacks from the saw the scale of the, the figures. But the figures actually had a, a particular thinking uh, behind them. And they do help to, ref to frame and reframe the reform package. Uh, and that enables you to go beyond just trying to compare what the reform package would be to the existing system. So we have to get beyond just looking at the existing arrangements and just comparing them to what the recommendations are 
to moving to see this is a reformed model that will take you into the future. And the first one was that we need an ambitious increase in investment. So tinkering with the current system and just adding bits here and there wasn't what we recommended. We said for all the reasons I mentioned earlier in the context that we needed an ambitious increase uh, in investment. And that would take account of the projected increases in enrollments that were mentioned, but also create an engaged, small group, high trust, high expectation teaching and learning. Because that's what's necessary if we're going to build people's capabilities to deal with the economic, social, and cultural challenges that I mentioned earlier. And you can see it in other countries who are at the same level of development of ourselves, because they are devoting more attention and resources to high quality education that is free at the point of access for students and students from a range of, of social backgrounds. So I'm not going to go into the figures. You know that we, what we recommended by way of an increase in the recurrent funding, but what we did say was that that increased funding was to provide for the increased demographics, but also to improve the quality of the student experience and the learning outcomes. And secondly, then, we talked about an increased investment in quality. In other words, that the funding that we were talking about would lead to excellent teaching, research, and scholarship across the spectrum, which would be the humanities, social sciences, and STEM disciplines. And we did say, and I'm just going to throw in this for mischief, is the fact that the debate and the arguments that still seem to go on and differentiation as between the humanities and STEM subjects, we do really need to bring that to an end. It's getting tired and boring in terms of the impact that all of this sort of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary can have on our, on our um, challenges that I mentioned earlier. So we did recommend a significant improvement in the student staffing ratio, which used to be 16 to 1, gone now to over 20 to 1, and we recommended over time bringing it back to 16 to 1 and then bringing it to 14 to 1 in the context of the challenges I mentioned earlier. And just to say that there are country, other countries at 10 to 1, which we're sort of aspiring to be uh, looking at and linked with. And then the third area, and I think it is important, very important, because if we go back to this issue as being a major issue of public policy and choices in public policy, then you're really talking about that it's part of the social contract in Irish society. And therefore, a key part of the social contract will have to be a major increase in access, participation, and progression for all economic and social groups. So it's crucially important, again, in terms of trying to explain why you need this ambitious level of investment, that this is one of the social contracts underpinning it. And that will require an increase in the value of student supports, an extension of those supports to part-time and postgraduate students, and also a more effective way of, as it were, delivering that uh, student financial aid. Now, the last issue I want to deal with then is if that's the scale of what you're saying, that it's ambitious in investment, don't mind the, the, the figures, we can argue them up or down. The next question is, is well then, what are the actual options for funding that investment. And again, our thinking centered on a number of areas, right? It centered on three broad strategies. And how would you balance the cost of what you're talking about as between society or the state or all of us wanting a higher education system and how it contributes to that, the student who's a beneficiary, uh, and employers who in Ireland are a significant beneficiary. And so we recommend it as a guiding principle that you have to look at the questions of fairness and balance and that they have to be taken into account in developing a new funding system. That's fairness and balance, as I said, between, as it were, the public benefits of higher education and the private uh, benefits, between investment and cost containment and between those with different levels of family income or access to resources to enable and help them in those uh, way. And that's what brings into focus the key issue of how we view the individual and collective benefits of higher education. Because when you look at what are the collective and individual benefits, that's obviously going to have an influence on how you decide it should be funded or, or resourced. And the question that we were talking about was how to share that. Now, I'm not going to go into 
a lot of the detail here either, except to say that we know in the decades since the 1950s, our higher education system has been at the heart of that public benefit in terms of our economic and social transformation. I mean, the numbers going into higher education, as we know, have soared, and well over half of our workforce now have a third level qualification. I mean, I remember there was nobody in my class went to higher education uh, when I left school, so you can have a guess at that now in terms of my age, but nobody did. Most of them afterwards, uh, obviously, did uh, what was known as the night courses and night degrees and all of that. And yet all of my family and all of my nieces and nephews and all of my neighbours' children are all, in some way or other, involved in third-level education at different levels within it. So it has been a huge transformation. As part of the review of... Um, for the review itself, we did engage in those terrible things called focus groups. But within the focus groups, it was very clear in all parts of the country that people did recognize the contribution of higher education to our society, to our economy, our culture, our public life, including the formation of citizens. And that was widely understood and valued. So we should recognize that and see how we, how we build on that. There was also a recognition around how it contributed both to individual fulfillment and collective good, and also that it's an end in itself, which is crucially important as well in terms of the pursuit of uh, knowledge and understanding uh, and meaning across, as I mentioned earlier, all disciplines. There was also an understanding, particularly uh, in, in outside of Dublin, that of the important and key role that universities and institutes of technology play as centers of research and knowledge generation and engines of regional and local development. And that came forward as a very strong uh, issue, as I say, certainly outside of the, the city. We also know that in overall terms, the state, through higher taxation and lower calls on welfare, benefits significantly from the investment that will have been made in, in higher education. And then the individual benefits, because graduates earn more. Uh, the calculations that we did showed that an honours degree or higher is linked to earning 100% more than adults whose highest educational attainment is a leaving cert or more. So that's, that's there, it's a fact, it's true. So we need to factor that in when we're looking at how we deal with it. So as I said, higher education contributes both to the individual success and to the collective good. And that's the sort of core idea that underpins the drive that has been in this country, a long-standing drive to widen access to higher education, further education, apprenticeships, and otherwise. And it's also an important consideration in determining how higher education should be funded. And it was one of the reasons that veered us away from recommending capping numbers, because the whole argument we are making is around, as I said, that role of widening access being the key part of our long-standing uh, goal for where we take a society in that. So as I indicated earlier, the three funding options that you're considering over there are seeking to balance the cost and share it between the state, the individual, and, and employers. So the first one was a predominantly state-funded system. Again, I'm not going to go into the detail except to say that that wouldn't mean that the state's contribution at the moment, which is about 64% to uh, the funding of higher education, will go up to 80%, other 20% coming from the, the various other groupings. So you could say, okay, the group advised, okay, that would deliver you the free access at the point of entry. So it covers that one off, and it would be administratively simple. However, and remember, all the options have both strong and negatives to them, and you have to consider them in that way. The question then is about the availability of sufficient state resources to implement that option, particularly going back to what I said earlier about the priorities around health services, housing, other areas of education. So where do you come in that demand? And also you have to ask the question of whether higher education, given the high individual benefits I mentioned, is actually or could be fully considered a pure public good. So that raises that particular question as to whether you can look at that on, on its own given the benefits to the individual within society. The second one then was the, essentially the status quo, uh, which was the continuation of the current system. 
And within that, we looked at providing a significant increase in investment by the state and a continuation of the 3,000 uh, student contribution with the fee waivers I mentioned, which about 50% get at the moment. So that model would increase the state's share of investment to 72% from the 64. Now again, you could acknowledge that that deals with the balance between the student and the, the individual and the, and the state. It's already established. However, it doesn't deal with the impact of the 3,000 on families, on some families. It doesn't deal with the fairness of the grant system and also the lack of support for postgraduates and part-time students. Uh, and it doesn't deliver free at the point of, of access, obviously. And the interesting thing is that when you look at other countries, there are no other countries with an actual fee in the system that don't have some arrangement for how you would actually pay that fee through a loan system or whatever. So they were the third area we looked at was a new system of deferred fees supported by income contingent loans. And within that, that you would have a moderate increase both in state funding and in the students' contribution. But that the state's share, as it were, would continue at, at 60%. And fees, as we know, would be charged to all students, but they would be deferred supported by income contingent loans and repayments would be linked to future salary levels and ability to pay and that. So that scenario we mentioned is a possibility and we put down two or three different options that we uh, uh, scaled out, but we did indicate that the fee should be regulated and should remain moderate and affordable. Now, since then, somebody has said to me, well, that recommendation was blown out of the water by Jeremy Corbyn in Britain. And I just want to say two things about that. Again, the context and what you're trying to achieve is important. In Britain, student loans were introduced not as part of the funding of higher education. They were introduced to withdraw the state's contribution to the funding of higher education. In the models that we've talked, all three, in one of them, the states, is, are you as a taxpayer still in there for 80%? In the second one, you're still uh, in there for seven, over 70%. And in the system of income contingent loans, you're still in there as a state or as a taxpayer for over 60%. So I just want to emphasize that. And then the other point that has been made of people saying, well, what about the United States? And that Barack Obama and Michelle Obama have only been paying off their student loans even when they're going into the presidency. But again, it's the difference between income contingent loans and mortgage loans, which again, the state's been a totally different system than what we're talking about. Now that's not to argue that all, because we did say all three options have merits to them, and negative elements to them, and are viable. So that's what is being discussed at the moment. Obviously, that approach would deliver ed higher education free at the point of access for all students. It would also enable resources to be diverted into maintenance support, so a broader base of students and higher levels of payments could, could, and could be uh, brought about. We also uh, dealt with within that of the whole question of acknowledging, however, that there is a risk aversion, as it were, to uh, our debt aversion in terms of how people would see such a system operating, the level of default was something obviously that was raised by a number of groupings of people, the impact of emigration and future graduate debt burden. So th that is a, these are factors that come into the uh, discussion as well. And then the fourth area we mentioned was a new employer contribution to higher education. And that was key in keeping again with the guiding principle of balance and fairness and the case of a better sharing of the costs involved in higher education among the main beneficiaries of higher education. So we did propose an increase in the national training levy and an expansion of that fund to provide greater support for programs in higher education. And specific funding or numbers were mentioned in that. And as you know, legislation or changes have been brought about to start that. So the very last point I'll make then is in deliberating around those uh, options, each of them, as I said, has strengths and weaknesses and you have to take those into account. It's important that each option is considered together because it's the relative advantages and disadvantages that are relevant. I mean, every funding instrument I mentioned there has a tangible negative, whether it's taxes, 
fees, student debt repayments, or a combination of all of these. So if we were to get out of the stalemate and the status quo to a new reform system, then you have to look at all of the possibilities and options uh, together. It's not realistic to cite the negative uh, characteristic of any one of the instruments in isolation, because that will lead you to a situation where you're trying to find a way of funding higher education that doesn't draw resources from some source. And that's where you'll end up back into a sort of negative, as it were, in your, in your own thinking. So the last point that I just want to make is around the overall conclusion. As I said, we believe, and I personally believe, and the report concludes, that we now have an opportunity to recommit and to reinvest in higher education. We have an opportunity to set a level of ambition for ourselves and to restore higher and further education and apprenticeships as a key enabler of our future development around all of the challenges, both societal and economic and international, that I mentioned earlier. However, in return, we also need to have a real debate with the sector as to what we require from the sector. Now, I say sector sort of wondering, is it a sector? Because even in our deliberations with the universities and the institutes of technology and other areas and that, it would be safer to say it's a collection of universities and IOTs, or indeed a collection of presidents might be a sort of easier way to put it. Now, I accept totally, and you would not want to remove this, that there's a level of competition both for the provision of programs, the numbers of students, the areas we're talking about. But the scale of ambition we're talking about here and where our country needs to go, we do need some level of cooperation and collaboration uh, and accountable autonomy around this. And part of the difficulty is, in fact, that the relationship between, I'll still call it the sector, and the state, whether that's the department or uh, the Oireachtas generally, has not been sorted out. Obviously, most places with the crash, everything is pulled in and constraints are put on everybody so we don't want the country to go down the tubes. Now we need to let that back out. And it needs to be let back out in a way that recognises that the sector is going to have to uh, play a dynamic role in, in, in all of this. But the key part of that is that it must become a sector, not in the negative way of where everybody does the same thing, but that enables it to engage with Irish society around the sort of benefits that I have mentioned and the enhanced role uh, it could play. So we do need universities and institutes of technology that are more responsive to the changing needs I mentioned earlier, both of the economy, of society, and of our public system, both in the medium and, and long term, and which gives more attention to the overall employability of graduates and how that can be approved, and also the role of higher education in terms of promoting access and ensuring that people from disadvantaged backgrounds, that that can be improved dramatically. Uh, all of this, and to achieve those challenges, the group concluded, would require a comprehensive and fundamental reformed uh, funding model. And I believe that we should continue to have an open and consider the discussion on this challenge, but ultimately, I think we are probably coming to the stage where decisions need to be made. So, thank you very much, Sarah.